Good morning, church. Uh, today's scripture reading is Mark, Mark 10, verse 17 to 31. As he was sitting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But he was dismayed by this demand, and he went away grieving, because he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were astonished at his words. Again, Jesus said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished, saying to one another, Then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, because all things are possible with God. Peter began to tell him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more. Now at this time, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and eternal life in the age to come. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the word of God. Be to God. Fam, good morning, good morning, good morning. I can't look each one of you in the eye, but let me do a quick scan. Great to see you. Great to be with you. If we have not met, my name is Reino. I have the privilege of serving this church as pastor and also of preaching to you this morning. Really excited about that. We're still working through the Gospel of Mark. Let me remind you where we are in the Gospel of Mark. Check this. We are in the second movement of Mark. The big question is, what does it mean for Jesus to be the Messiah? That's what he wants to answer in these chapters. A couple of weeks ago, Jesus dropped a big one. You guys will remember that one. It's a turning point in the book of Mark. Jesus is in Caesarea Philippi. He's at the so-called gates of hell. He says to his disciples, we'll win this thing. And here's how we're going to win it. I die, you die, I live, you live. That's how we roll. Now, people have question marks about that because it sounds counterintuitive. I mean, didn't Jesus say win, but then he says lose? Didn't he say live, but now he says die? So in his first announcement of his death, there's question marks. There are question marks. This is the second announcement of his death in chapter 9. Still some question marks. Third announcement of his death, we'll get there next week. Still some question marks about why is this the way it's supposed to go down. Now in between these three announcements, we find stories of what it looks like when people say, Yep, I'm in. We find stories of what it looks like when people really struggle with it, right? They really grapple with it. Like, how can this be? And then we also find stories of people just outright rejecting it, like today's teaching text. Real talk, fam. These are difficult passages. And these are difficult teachings. And these are very difficult commands to obey. Like, even as Rochelle read the teaching text, and I mean, I've been studying this text backwards and forwards this whole week, I went, <laughs> This is odd. It's not going to go away though, because the Bible is the Bible, and we believe in it and we preach it. So, let's go for it. Why don't we jump in, and we grapple, and we work through it, and we learn together. I want to ask you two questions before we jump in. Check this. Do you feel like you lack one thing? Do you feel like you lack one thing. Second question, do you love your money more than you love Jesus? 
Do you love your money more than you love Jesus? It's a long passage. So I want to use these questions as a frame for the sermon. So this is where we're going to go. Read it with me. Well, not that one. The next one. There we go. What is the question? What is the answer? How is it possible? And is it worth it? Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, this is a hard scripture, but it's the truth. And you call the shots and we don't because you are God and we are not. We are your people, saved by grace. Thank you for bringing us into your family. Thank you for making us part of a church. Thank you for giving us the setting to learn from your word. And thank you for transforming us through your word as we study it and as we apply it to our lives. My prayer is simple, Lord Jesus, and that is that you would illuminate our hearts, this, our minds this morning, that you would soften our hearts, that you would do a work in deep places, and that we would leave here transformed and inspired to give it all to you. I pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. What is the question? First point. Now, here, here is the question. It's coming at you. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the question from this teaching text. Okay, now let's look at verse 17 to 20 first. Verse 17 is exaggerated and it's desperate. And there's a reason for it. Do you see a guy running to Jesus? Do you see a guy falling to his knees or knelt down before Jesus? He calls Jesus good teacher. No one has called Jesus good teacher up until this point. And then, uh, even before they could do the pleasantries, how are you, I'm well in yourself, and I'm also good, thank you, he lashes out with a question, but it's a super, super clear question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? This person knows that he's got a hole. He's really desperate and he wants an answer now. Because for some reason, he can't deal with the lack he is experiencing. Jesus doesn't answer him immediately. Jesus asks him a question first. Why do you call me good? The emphasis on that question is not on good. The emphasis is on me. And then Jesus says to him, no one is good except God alone. So clearly, Jesus wants this person to think about God's goodness first. Right? So let's start there. I see your desperation. I hear your question. Let's start with, have you thought about God's goodness recently? Because God is the one who, Luke tells us, fills the hungry with good things. God is the one who gives good gifts to His children, Matthew 7, Luke 11. The brother of Jesus, James, later says, every good endowment and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. So the purpose of Jesus is not to draw attention to Himself, it's to draw attention to God who saves, who heals, who forgives, who restores, and who gives what? Eternal life. The very thing that this person is asking about. So don't interpret Jesus as saying, look, I'm not perfect, or I am somehow imperfect. Jesus just wants the light to shine on God's goodness. Quick question. Have you thought about God's goodness recently? Have you? It's crucially important for us, especially when we experience lack or anxiety, or stress. Think about everything that God has done for you, starting with your salvation and then working your way through the rest. The mere fact that you've got breath in your lungs this morning is a gift of grace from our Heavenly Father. So Jesus pauses this conversation and starts there. And then in verse 19, he says to the guy, look, you know what to do to be in right relationship with God. And then he says, you know the commandments. And then Jesus gives him the commandments. Not all of them. Also not in the order that we are used to. And also there's a little mashup of two commandments there. All the Bible nerds in the house, can you see it? That's translated here as do not defraud. That's a mashup of two commandments. So the nerds in the house will go... We'll have to go home and study it themselves because I don't have time now to talk to you about the first table and the second table and how they all fit together. But Jesus says to him, dude, you know what to do to be in right relationship with God. Yes? 
Because if you're in the right relationship with God, you won't feel lack, will you? Because then myself and my Creator are in perfect unity with one another. Now, this man answers Jesus with the title of a very popular Netflix series, Nailed It! That's what he says. Teacher, I have kept all these from my youth. As far as I can tell Jesus, I have done these things and I am doing what is required of me to be in right relationship with God. And no one says anything. It goes unchallenged. Which means that this guy was probably speaking the truth. Think about it. This is a great guy. This is, a, in the words of King Charles, an accomplished fellow. He's a really, really smart guy. Because he stands in front of a whole lot of people and he says, look, Jesus, I'm, I'm doing well. And everyone goes, yeah, yeah. He's a great guy. Really solid. Top lad. But I'm desperate. <laughs> like, nailed it, but I still lack. So here's what I want you to do, Jesus. Just tell me what to do. Because I'm good at doing stuff. See, that's what he says. I am good in getting stuff done. So I lack, tell me what to do, I'll get it done, and I'll move on from there. And the whole will be away. That's his posture. Not arrogant, confident. Okay, so that's the question. Now, what is the answer? Here's the answer. Go, sell all you have, and give to the poor. Then come follow me. And that last sentence is very important. The answer isn't, go and sell all your stuff and give it to the poor. Ah, that's a step. Then the next step is, come and follow me. Let's look at verses 21 and 22. Looking at him, Jesus loved him. Fam, Jesus gave this guy some time. And he was actually looking at him. Recognizing him. Have you guys ever watched Parliament? I recognize you. Yeah? Do you guys ever watch Parliament? <laughs> he was looking at him. Acknowledging him. Recognizing him. Holding space for this moment. And then it says he loved him. In the Greek text, it's, a, it's an active verb. So it's not something Jesus did deep in his heart. He didn't love him deep in his heart. He actually loved him with some or another action. So it's possible that Jesus could have walked up to him and put his hands on his shoulders, looked him in the eye, or hugged him. Have you guys ever watched The Chosen? Anybody? Do you know what's fascinating about The Chosen? Is Jesus really touches people a lot. But every time he touches someone, it touches me. Because that was the close proximity he was in to people. Or he, or he put his hand on his shoulder and went, Dude, I see you. Yeah? And then Jesus tests his commitment. Because the guy just said, nailed it, very committed to the cause. Torah observant Jew. I am in. And now Jesus says, okay, let's see how in you are. Because you came to me, remember? You believe that I have the answer, remember? Now I'm going to give you the answer. Let's see if you'll accept it. Here's the answer. Go, sell all you have, and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Verse 22 says, Dismayed and went away grieving. Let me act this out for you. Here's what happened when Jesus gave him that answer. Look, he went like this. I can't. I can't do this. I can. I can't. I can't. Whew. 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 I can't. I can't do this. That's how he reacted. It literally, it literally says his face fell and then he experienced exactly the same thing Jesus experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know in Mark 14, 34, we'll get there in a few weeks' time, Jesus says, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. 
It's the same verb that's used to describe this man's reaction. Jesus is in Gethsemane. He's looking at the cross. He knows what lies, he knows what lies ahead tomorrow. And he goes, I can't. I can't do this. I cannot do this. That's how this man reacts when Jesus gives him the answer. Why does this man react in this way? Because it's not difficult for a rich man to give away a little now, is it? It's difficult for a rich man to give away everything. And here's the thing, fam. The rich person is dead scared of being poor. And that's why you hold on to your money. Out of fear. Because you just never want to be poor. Now, hang on. Did Jesus say to the guy, you are going to be poor? He didn't. But the guy was so scared of being poor, he went into a full-blown panic attack. Now, in only a few verses' time, Jesus will explicitly tell his disciples, if they are going to be poor, if they do decide to follow him. Okay? We'll get there now. Jesus gave a command. He said, follow me. And the only thing that this man had to do is to take the step of faith. And to go, okay, I'll do it. But he couldn't. So this really nice guy, who everyone likes, who's a really stand-up fellow, is out. He's not in. Why? Well, you lack one thing. Complete surrender of your money and wealth to me. That's what Jesus says. You love your money more than you love me. Why? Because when it came to a head and you had to choose, you chose your money. You chose your wealth. You're trusting in your wealth to do for you what only I can do for you. Remember, you came to me with a hole. You came to me desperate and kneeling, calling me names that other people don't even call me. You came to me wanting an answer. Now I gave it to you. Now you're not accepting it. You are choosing against me, not for me. How about you? I want to ask you again, do you feel like you lack one thing? Do you love your money more than you love Jesus? Are you scared of being poor? And that's why, at all cost, you hang on to your money. So what's the question? We covered that one. What's the answer? We covered that one. Now the question is, how is it possible? And here's the answer. It comes from the text. All things are possible with God. Let's continue. Verse 23 to 27. Look at the word hard for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Okay. Why is it hard? Here's the answer. Because wealth competes for loyalty and it competes with your loyalty to God. And that's why those who have it find it difficult to receive God's rule. Let's think about this for a minute. You have to rule over your money, don't you? Like you have it and it's yours. Someone has to decide what happens with this money. And that's the question. Who gets to decide? Do I decide or do God decide? Because in the kingdom of God, He decides. And you can't be in the kingdom of God and keep rule over your money away from Him. That's why this really nice guy who wants to rule over his money is out. He can't come in. So if you come in, the one thing you do is you relinquish control of your money and you let God decide what to do with your money and not you. And see, the issue with wealth and the rich man is the more wealth you have, the more responsibilities you have. The more responsibilities you have, the more you have to rule over it. The more you have to rule over it, you more, you know, the more you experience this power struggle with God wants to call the shots and I want to call the shots and we can't have two people call the shots. That's why it's hard. Simple illustration. Should I buy a new car or not? If you don't have money for a new car, 
then that conversation isn't even on the table. But now you're rich, and you have money, and now you want a new car. So who gets to decide if I get a new car? I or God? But look, I, I really want a new car. And it really makes sense, you know. Trading value, used to the installment, insurance vibes, you know. Keep it new, keep it trendy. Huh? Is that so? That's you deciding, that's not God deciding. But it's hard, because it's mine. But in the kingdom of God, it's not. So who gets to rule over my money? This tension and the struggle that I'm busy explaining isn't the first time that Jesus actually spoke about this. Let me give it to you straight. Matthew 6, verse 24. Look at what Jesus says. No one can serve two masters, since either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's why it's hard. And look at what, uh, what, what verse 24 says. Verse 24 says, They were astonished. Why on earth were they astonished? Because they thought that rich people were hashtag blessed. <laughs> they thought that you all want to be rich because rich people are blessed because God gave them all these things. They live the good life and we don't. And now Jesus says, as a matter of fact, it's a real struggle for them to get into the kingdom. There's no VIP parking in the kingdom for the rich folk. There's no VIP seating in the kingdom for the rich folk. You guys got it all wrong. That's why verse 24 says, they are astonished. Jesus says to them, you know, this folk that you all follow on Instagram, all these gazillionaires, some of them might not even be in the kingdom. Do you remember the really nice guy that fell at my feet a few moments ago? The guy that you all love? He's out. Now before you judge, Jesus repeats his words, and then he says nothing about the rich. Look at it. Verse 25, 4. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. So just before you point your index finger at the rich folk, Jesus says, hang on, hang on, hang on. It's tough for everyone. It doesn't matter how much you have. Rich and poor alike, you will have the same struggle. Okay, so let's tease this one out. Is this surrender of everything I have equally difficult for everyone? Is this surrendering the rule of my stuff equally difficult for everyone? Is this loving Jesus more than loving my stuff equally difficult for everyone? The answer is yes. That's why Jesus repeats it and leaves out the one category that he just spoke about. Okay, so how difficult is this? Verse 25 says, It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When Jesus says eye of a needle and camel, what he means is eye of a needle and camel. I've heard some really clever illustrations by pastors saying, you know, there was a gate in Jerusalem. It was called the needle gate. It was quite a struggle for, for camels to get through there. That needle gate was built in the Middle Ages. Definitely wasn't there in the time of Jesus. Jesus is exaggerating. So he's talking about a needle. Fam, have you ever tried to put thread through a needle? Check this. You hold it far first, and then you go, wait, wait, wait. And then you go, let me just, okay, wait, let me go far again. Okay, let me just breathe. Let me try again. It's difficult with thread, fam. Can you imagine a rope? Can you imagine a camel? It's very difficult. And that's why Jesus uses this illustration. It's not impossible though, but very, very difficult. And then verse 26 says to us, They were even more astonished, saying, Then who can be saved? Why? Because it sounds impossible for a camel to get through an eye of a needle. And secondly, this was a really great guy. I'm not even close to that great. And he's great and he's out. So what chance do I have? 
I'm done. Like if he doesn't have a chance, I definitely don't have a chance. And then Jesus does exactly the same to the crowd. Look at verse 27. Looking at them. He holds this moment. He scans through them. He recognizes them. He can feel the weight of this moment. And then he says, with man it is impossible. But not with God. Because all things are possible with God. Do you believe this? Because if you do, and you respond to the teaching of Jesus, it asks for faith. Things that are unseen. It asks for faith. Think about this. I want to be in. I want to surrender everything. I want to give God rule over all my stuff. I know it's difficult. It is as difficult as a camel that has to go through the eye of a needle, but I know it's not impossible. So God, please, I want to do this. Help me to do this. I am busy doing this. Now please do this for me. Do you see how the prayer goes? Because it's possible with God. Do you guys realize that I can make a remark like that and say, we can just speak to God because Jesus died for us on the cross? Do you guys realize that? It's like Jesus made a way for us that we, in this struggle we have, can actually approach God without having to uh, jump any hoops or qualify for it and ask Him, if you say that it's possible for you, Please do it inside of me. Oh, hang on. We can give everything because Jesus gave us everything. Do you see it? That's the response. On the cross, Jesus gave it all. And the hymn goes, all to him we owe. That's the response to the gospel. And because of what he did on the cross for us, we can be in relationship with God. And being in relationship with God means that we can pray this prayer. Please do this inside of us. So how is it possible? All things are possible with God. Let's look at the fourth one. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? The answer from the text says, A hundred times more. Now at this time, and eternal life in the age to come. Are you guys familiar with uh, the English saying, 100%? Have you ever had someone answer you like that? You ask them something and they are so certain about it, before you've even, fi uh, before you've even finished your question, will we be able to 100%? That's what Jesus says. Look at it with me. Let's study this portion of text. It's really important. Jesus actually doesn't say 100%. He says 100 times. Peter goes, <coughs> look, just asking for a friend here. Yeah? We're doing quite well because we did what the rich young ruler couldn't do. So just asking for a friend here, yeah? are we going to get something? Do you see the question? That's exactly what he says. We have left everything and followed you. Anything in it for us, maybe? Because I mean, remember, the guy asked, what must I do now to inherit? So give me something to do now so that I'm sure I'll get it at the end. Now Peter goes, we did give to you now. Anything for us? Waiting. And Jesus doesn't go, hey, Peter, dude, come on now. Jesus actually answers him. Compassionately. With very reassuring words. Truly I tell you, I've said this before, when Jesus says truly I tell you, highlighter comes out. Highlight. <laughs> Capitalization, uppercase. Because what is about to follow is very, very important. Now look at what Jesus says. No one who has left. Okay, so no ranks or hierarchy there. No one who has left for my sake and for the sake of the gospel really important, who will not receive a hundred times more now at this time. Jesus repeats the things that people might have left for him. And then he says, that is what you will receive a hundred times more now at this time. 
with persecutions, even though you guys are facing persecution and tough times do lie ahead, I'll still give you what you need. And after all of that, eternal life in the age to come. So if we nailed it now, what do we get? And is it worth it? Jesus says, absolutely. I'll sort you out. I'll give you what you need because I know what you need. So if you give it all to me and you follow me, I'll make sure that you sort it. And you'll get more back than you actually sacrificed for me. I'm not making this up, fam. It's in the Bible. That's what Jesus says. Okay, so where will all the houses, brothers, sisters, and land come from? I think Jesus has in view the church community. I mean, think about it. Listen, uh, you are all one new happy family. Great. I'm ruling all of your money. So I'll make sure that you all have. So you won't lack. That's the vision Jesus has for the church. I don't know how close or how far we are from that one, but that's the vision he has. So whatever you're giving up, there's more than enough going around for me to make sure that everyone has what they need. And after all, we are looking ahead to the ultimate prize. And then I'll bless you with eternal life in the age to come. So, jaw dropper again, right? Firstly, the rich young ruler drops his jaw. Secondly, the disciples drop their jaw and go, what are you serious? And Jesus goes, absolutely. I'll take care of you. As you'll take care of each other. And ultimate reward in the age to come. You'll receive that from me as well. Can you trust me on this one? Is what Jesus says to his people. So I want to ask that to you. Can you trust Jesus on this one? Because the invitation is actually really simple. Follow me and I'll do the rest. And in today's text, it's surrender your control over everything. And then Jesus finishes it with many first, last, last, first. So many who are first will be last and the last first. It's a saying in which Jesus says, because this is the way to get in, because this is the way to get what I actually offer, you'll be really surprised by who gets in. Because you remember the really nice guy that you all loved? He's out. So you'll be surprised to see who actually does this. And then Jesus goes, drops mic, leaves. There's no more conversation. That's it. So how do we respond to this? Let me map out what I think are four possible responses. Um, you guys can come and get ready to lead us in song. I think a first response is acknowledge that you lack one thing. Confess your desperation. That's one thing that this young man got right. He was honest about the fact that even though, according to him and his understanding of the law, he does everything right, he is still missing one thing. Do you live with a hole in your soul? Do you feel empty? Do you go to bed in the evening and when all quiets down, you're confronted with the fact that you're not living life in abundance at all? And that you've got this huge hole that you want to fill? Maybe that's your response today. Is to confess and to say, Lord Jesus, I desperately lack one thing. I think a second response, if we think about the second question that we handled this morning, is are you compelled to do what he commands? Because remember, Jesus said, this is what you do, and then you come and you follow me. Some of you might be confessing Christians, but you've actually never said I mean, I'll do what you tell me and I'll follow you. Maybe today this text leads you to that point. To say, I will obey and I will follow. Even though 
the reaction might be, can't do this, can't do this, can't do this. You can, through the grace of God, because all things are possible with Him. Maybe that's a response. Maybe your response is, Father God, I'm going to trust you to do this thing in me because I cannot do it myself. I need your help. I'm desperately, desperately scared of being poor. And I can't give you control of my money. Because what if I'm poor? Maybe your response is to humble yourself and to say, help me. Help me, help me, help me, because I want to do this. Maybe your response today is to take Jesus at His word. I'm not making this promise to you. The Bible is. I'm just the messenger. I can't make it happen anyway. But Jesus says it is worth it. 100%. Do you believe Him? Do you believe this? Will you take Him at His word? If not, why not? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know it's not your will for us to lack one thing. We know it's your will to give us life and life in abundance. But some of us, Lord Jesus, walk around with this hole that only you can fill. And exactly like this young man in the teaching text, we keep on believing that we can fill it ourselves. Especially with money and things. Help us this morning, Lord Jesus, to acknowledge that we lack and to acknowledge our desperation. Will you please help all my brothers and sisters who's in that current struggle to receive the power to say that? And will you meet them in that place? Like you met the young man first and then the crowd, looking and loving and compassionately answering with the reassurance that you'll take care of us. Lord Jesus, we, we want to be disciples who obey you. And sometimes we just outright disobedient. And Lord Jesus, if I'm honest, sometimes we don't even feel bad about it anymore. Our hearts are so calloused. Our minds are so fixated on the things of this world that we don't even care that we sin. We also don't even repent after we've sinned. But today we hear that there's a command and there's a choice. And our choice is will we obey or will we not? Make us obedient. Make us obedient. Father God, you know our struggle. You know our pride. You know how we resist the whisper of your voice. It's almost impossible for us to get through the needle, but we know that all things are possible with you. So please help us to surrender, and please meet us in this moment of surrender. Guide our thoughts, give, our clar give us clarity. Help us to listen to you as you rule over our things. And lastly, Lord Jesus, we know that we are kids. We know that you take care of us. We know that we'll inherit everything you have. And even though we might know it, we sometimes just don't believe it. Please help us this morning to take you at your word and to give that step of faith. We want to follow you, Lord Jesus, for your name, for your glory, for your kingdom. We pray that in your name. Amen.